I'd like to welcome Graham, um, who uh, has been working with the Raspberry Pi Pico board. Now, Graham has been doing a lot of work with Raspberry Pi um, in the advance of the Pico launch with the Raspberry Pi Pico board. And what Graham's done is he's ported a BBC micro emulator to the Raspberry Pi Pico. So uh, welcome, Graham, if you'd like, just like to introduce yourself and tell us exactly how you've done this magic. Yep. Um, yeah, my name is Graham Sanderson, and um, as I say, I'm currently uh, working with Raspberry Pi. I'll probably uh, dive into my slide deck since um, I actually have an intro slide. Um, so let's let's try try and do that. Um, you, can, you can keep me for a little bit. Um, so um, I'm also a 1980s kid. Uh, grew up with my. Uh, home computer in my bedroom writing lots of and writing but not finishing any games um, and uh, I actually started uh, with a ZX81 uh, for my 10th birthday um, and wrote my first basic my first ever program which was in basic uh, typed in I think because uh, um, I didn't even have a cassette back then um, and uh, you know I did a little bit of gaming and of course enjoy, greatly enjoyed 3D monster maze but I pretty quickly moved on to a, a uh, BBC uh, Micro Model B, which was pretty much where I spent my formative coding coding years using. Um, obviously, played a lot of the, the great games that came out <clears throat> during that time, but you know that was the first uh, introduction I had to assembly. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I wrote a, um, a a variety of games in that time, which I'm really hoping um, are still on some disc discs, uh, some, floppy, some floppy discs at my, at my home in England, or my parents' house in England, um, which I thought were lost, but I guess you guys can recover them now. Um, but, I, you know, I got to the stage of, um, I had a one pixel vertical scroller, but it, only, it turned out it only worked on my monitor because I didn't know about vertical rupture. And then uh, the um, I also had a sort of sphere of destiny two track, changing the colors um, based on a time in truck kind of game. And so I'm really hoping I can uh, find those in the future. Um, since then, I've been, um, you know, I've worked in software um, uh, my entire life, um, you know, ha having, you know, started at IBM when I was like 17 in 1989, you know, I I've seen the inside of everything. And, you know, I do a lot of work now in, you know, distributed systems and, um, uh, you know, highly scalable concurrent architectures and stuff like that. Done a lot of database um, implementation work, sort of bespoke databases, a lot of graphic stuff, but, it, but just generally a bit of everything, um, operating system stuff. And so um, I was actually taking a break in um, 2018, and Evan Upton, um, uh, who I've known for ages, um, um, another BBC micro kid, of course, um, uh, he um, talked to me about um, the RP2040, um, although it wasn't called that yet, it didn't have the right <laughs> amounts of RAM to be an RP2040 or, or anything like that. But he was very, very focused on making sure that the um, that the processor, or, or rather this chip, um, was entirely deterministic and could be pushed all the way to the edge. You know, he didn't want to have to build in a 10% margin or have st stuff where you couldn't quite reason down to the cycle level about whether something should or shouldn't work. And, and so um, as the chip development was going on, he was like, do you want to just initially my role was just to go play with it and, and kick the tires but it kind of evolved into a larger role um, and um, you know I um, a larger role um, which sort of ended up with me also being um, the sort of lead developer of the SDK but it was really fun though um, to after 35 years of you know much higher level systems to go back to something very much like what I started with uh, on, on a BBC micro um, and it was also kind of interesting because almost everything um, could be broken, you know, it was either my code or the hardware or the debugger or the firmware or, or a bunch of other stuff. And so 
it was cool though. I got I, I did a bunch of oops, did a bunch of hardware design um, or it, it feedback on the hardware design, particularly the DMA, the PIO, and stuff like that. And um, it was actually useful writing things like emulators. And I got a movie player and I got a port of uh, was, well, I call it Zrach to, to avoid uh, <laughs> to avoid copyright issues. Um, but, uh, uh, but so that's kind of what I've been doing. Um, emulators. I'm, I'm probably going to zip through these slides because I think I'm a little probably going to be a little behind, but um, I, I actually wrote a PlayStation emulator as my first emulator, um, and it was in C, but then in about 2003, someone said that Java was too slow to write an emulator, so I, uh, I, I obviously had to write an emulator, and so uh, I, I, I demonstrated that at Java 1 in 2006, but it, it, um, it was pretty cool, and that was about the last time I ever wanted to do actual reverse engineering stuff where, where you're, you know, stepping through... Uh, R3000 code to figure out what's going on. So in these later emulators, I've started with someone else's emulator who already knows how it works. But um, it's kind of funny, back in the JPSX, um, with the PlayStation, they actually had printouts in a lot of the other games because they didn't do anything on the device, so that was quite handy. Um, I, the first emulator I wrote for the Pico is actually a Spectrum emulator. And the reason for that was it just was simpler. I, you know, I kind of wanted to do a BBC emulator, but I knew that it was going to be hard with all the cycle accurate timing. And my, my Specky emulator called Khan because I needed a code name that people wouldn't guess what it is. And it's 1981. So I, I figured, you know, Wrath of Khan go with that. But uh, um, that one actually ran on the FPGA. So we're limited to 48 megahertz. Um, it, um, for those who know about spe spectrums, it doesn't do correct cycle timing memory access stuff. Um, and then once RP2040 got more RAM, I was able to put in a 128K spectrum and the AY sound chip. So that was cool. And then I always wanted to do a BBC micro emulator, A, because I started off on BBC, and B, because I knew Evan wanted one. And uh, Evan has a good habit that when he wants something from me of just telling me it's impossible or <laughs> it's hard. And so that's kind of how, how, how the BBC micro emulator came about. Um, so I, I, I don't know how many people are familiar with a um, RP2040, but, uh, or the Raspberry Pi Pico, which is just a microcontroller board using the RP2040 which is Raspberry Pi's first um, silicon, uh, you know, custom silicon. Um, but it has two um, ARM Cortex M0 pluses, um, which are normally clocked um, up to 133 megahertz. Um, in, the, in my emulator, I actually run them at 270, which is actually um, fine on pretty much all boards, but um, isn't quotes supported. Um, it's got 264K of RAM. Um, it's got two megabytes of flash, at least the Pico does. Um, the RP2040 can use, has external flash and, and can use up to 16 meg. It's got 26 GPIOs on the Pico. Um, there's a few, there's uh, 30 on the RP2040. Um, and so we'll get some of those in a bit. Um, there's a bunch of DMA channels, which is, the, the DMA system is really, really cool. That's good. It has these eight PIO state machines and PIO is basically programmable IO where you run tiny little programs that run on these little state machines for interacting with hardware, but at exact cycle accuracy so you can you, you you can interact with things that you know at system clock rate or half system clock rate um and as i say the the actual chip has no audio and video support but you can use the pio to to generate video signals and you know audio signals or or i2s or whatever so um i have to say you know i was like i want to write a bbc emulator i need to pick one and there are, there are loads of good emulators out there and I wasn't at all scientific. I just I, I knew I wanted it in C and C plus plus because that would be easier support. Um, I wanted to support both BBC Micro Model B and BBC Master because I'd already seen some bit shift demos on YouTube. And um, I um, uh, wanted something that was still being developed. Um, um, and then I also uh, wanted something. You know, I just took a brief look at some source code, and I wanted it. I wanted to sort of be able to. I had kind of an idea of what I'd have to do. And so I was looking at something that was relatively simple, um, you know, and and, and um, I, I, one of the first considerations was B2, but I didn't want to, I, I thought that was overkill in terms of like simulating half cycle clocks and, and, and the hardware at that level. Um, now, um, I didn't have to be a rocket scientist that, to, to realize that size was gonna be an issue. You know, we only have 264K of RAM. Um, and so one of the first things I did is just to take the code base and if def out bun bunches of kind of 
high level functionality. So get rid of tape because we you know got disk. Get rid of SCSI. Get rid of tube. Get rid of debugger. You know, and and, and have these all if def about so I can build with or without them um, as and when I want to put them back in. Um, you know, we've got a whole bunch of ROMs and a whole bunch of disks. Um, the original emulator copied these into RAM for various reasons. Um, and, and, you know, you don't even really think about it, you know, um, alloc malloc uh, mallocing a buffer to store a game uh, disk image in um, when, you're, when you're writing for a PC, but obviously harder for a microcontroller. Um, it's super handy uh, when you're writing um, emulators to use lookup tables to speed things up, but of course these tend to be big. Um, BBC wasn't as bad as my Spectrum one, actually. The Spectrum one had about 700K <laughs> of lookup tables in the source emulator I was using, which is, which is really no good. Um, and then finally, you just want to um, uh, um, save space for hot functions to be in RAM. So bear in mind that um, um, when you're writing, uh, you know, code by default runs from Flash uh, on the RP2040, but that is, is slower. Um, there is a 16K cache. Um, but um, especially for video stuff, um, you really you need to have some functions in RAM um, so that they are so that they're obviously uh, going to execute with no latency. Um, and so um, we do all of this, um, and then um, I have to figure out um, how to test this. You know, initially it just won't fit on the device. Um, and I want to make sure that I didn't break it as I was slowly hacking stuff out. Um, which brings you uh, to a thing we have in the RP2040 SDK called host mode. Um, and host mode is, is just kind of like an iOS simulator if you've ever used that. Basically, we take the same code base and compile it for your native machine. Um, and then it, it uses um, the, the builds, switches out, stubbed out or re-implemented libraries. Um, and so here we've got a little picture of it running on my Mac and it's running um, Evan's 2048 game. Um, um, but puzzle game. Um, but the nice thing is um, you can run, um, if you use um, our audio and video libraries we have in the repository called Pico Extras, which sort of provides virtual hardware uh, for audio and video on, on, on the RP2040, then you can run the same, the same code on your, on your, on your PC um, and it uses STL2 and you can, you can run the game, which means you can do a lot of the porting work before you even get to the device and make, make sure stuff's working. And so in general, we use host mode for testing or, you know, if you want to stick a bunch of printfs in for debugging, that can be real uh, troublesome on the device. And also sometimes test code uses data that's just too big to fit on the device. Um, the other obvious issue we had is speed. Um, uh, you know, uh, Traditionally, BBC emulators, I mean, there's some fantastically fast BBC emulators out there, um, which do clever things, um, but we can't really do stuff like code translation um, because we don't have any RAM space, you know, we can't, um, if, if, you know, the sorts of tricks that BBASM or BJIT um, cool require, you know, you to copy the code effectively and, and, and we just don't have space for that. You know, we've got 120, we, we support BBC Master 128 and we've only got 256 of RAM. So, you know, we're already using half the RAM for the actual device being emulated. So the obvious choice was to, um, the first thing obvious choice for speed is just to use um, assembly. So write 6502 bit in on thumb assembly. Um, but even then you um, bear in mind that you're emulating a two megahertz um, CPU, um, you know, and, um, you know, even if you're running at 270 megahertz, um, that's still 145 cycles per, per clock. Um, and um, uh, because of the way the BBC works, you need to do a whole lot of cycle accurate stuff per clock, you know, the timing, timers, and particularly the video, as I'm sure all of you are fantastically familiar with, require a, a, a huge amount of cycle accuracy. I, I'm, I'm sort of semi-assuming that uh, people are pretty familiar with the ins and outs of the hardware, but um, if not, hopefully some of this makes sense. Um, so um, here's some code from the original um, version of VM, um, which um, I'm not showing to com complain about or in any way, it, it's perfectly sensible, it's easy to understand, and it, it does the right thing. But just to give you an example of how much work is being done per cycle. So 
here um, we're actually um, uh, looking at the emulation and a JSR instruction is being executed. Um, we've got my, this is the um, VM running and you, so you can see the, I've hit a breakpoint in the debugger. You can see um, the blue highlighted um, function is executing the opcodes in a loop. And there's a big switch statement for the type of opcode and we're doing a JSR and it does a bunch of things. And two times in the cycle, it calls poll time, which is to say this many cycles have passed now I need to do something with the hardware. And so if we look at what, it, what that does, it basically says this many cycles have passed. And then I want to see if the VIA, the system VIA needs something, the user VIA need, needs to do anything, this, the video needs to poll anything, and then a bunch of stuff with the disks. Um, but all of this stuff is called multiple times potentially per, um, per CP, 6502 CPU instruction. And then if we look at the video code, you know, for each, for, for every clock that's passed, we need to do a whole bunch of stuff um, to do with the CRTC, seeing where, where the character is in, with relation to the display. You know, have we reached the horizontal display count? Have we reached the sync position? Um, and then you know, if it's within a character, we need to loop for eight pixels and draw a pixel, a pixel using this rather scary looking um, uh, function on the right there. I don't know how well you can see that. Um, and then that goes off and calls, you know, another, you know, and, and down, down at the lowest level, we're actually drawing the individual pixel um, with a function call, albeit an in line one. Um, and as I say, so it's not a criticism, but on an RP, on a, um, you know, writing for a microcontroller, you're much more constrained than you would be, you know, on a, on a, on a PC, it really doesn't matter. Things are so fast that you can totally, totally do that. Um, but especially on an ARM Cortex M0, Assuming your fu the function you're calling actually does a bunch of stuff and potentially uses um, all the general purpose registers, then it's about 45 set cycles to call a function. By the time you've actually branched to the function on the left, you've saved the registers in the middle there, and then you've restored the registers on the way out. And um, then I've written R0 to R3 are trash because it really affects the quality of the code in your calling function too, because you have um, the, the function call doesn't preserve those four which is half of the useful registers. So um, this, apologies for this slide, which is um, completely uh, overwrought. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, have it, uh, I have a new, new CPU, as I mentioned, which is um, based in ARM Thumb Assembly. It has a C version as well. Um, it's, it's the, 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 most of the code is generated uh, using a little Ruby script um, and um, it, uh, so it has a C version and an ARM thumb version. The C version is to run on in host mode. Um, and actually I have it set up so that you can run the original VM. I have a Franken build, which lets you build a whole variety of different combinations of the emulator. And one is, one of them is BM, the original, and then BM with stuff hacked out and then BM using this CPU rather than their CPU. And then uh, we'll get to HW events in a, sec a second, but um, using that and so, um, but the, the interesting thing about this new CPU compared to the old CPU is it doesn't do any of that sub sub cycle state tracking. It's just here's an instruction, do it, and then add n cycles to the to the tick to, to the tick counter or the the six five zero two CPU counter. Um, so that's something we have to worry about um, later. But the only time, of course, you care is actually when you interact with the hardware. That's the only time it matters. Um, or when the hardware wants to interrupt you, that's the only time it matters where in the cycle you are. Um, it does matter if you write to the timer register two thirds of the way through a instruction. Um, but the nice thing about that is you can actually look at the instruction in those exceptional cases and figure out where in the, where you are through the cycle and adjust accordingly. And so it's a little bit more work, but it saves a lot of per instruction instruction work. Um, the next thing to avoid, um, and so this is probably one of the more time consuming bits was effectively turning the emulator inside out, which is rather than being a loop of instructions, which checks whether it's to poll, basically when it's called poll time for a reason, it checks to see if it's time to do something. Instead, um, we keep a priority queue of the cycles at which point something interesting with the hardware needs to happen. And that's either that the hardware needs to be polled, 
because it's a sort of periodic thing or it's because the hardware is going to generate an interrupt on that cycle. And so the, the CPU can actually run in a loop um, for a number of cycles. And in the ASM code, it's, it's better even than a loop. It's a sort of, um, it's, a, it's a tail chain function thing, but um, it, that's not super, super relevant. But it, it can say, okay, I don't have to do anything for 128 cycles. I'm just gonna run instructions for 128 cycles. And as I said, the hardware has decided when it needs to be woken up. And, and actually, um, we actually do en end up waking up pretty rapid, re repeatedly because we want to keep in line with the, with the beam, the, um, the, the cathode ray tube beam. And so we wake up every 128 cycles anyway, which is a scan line. But that still gives us a much better, you know, we're running 128 cycles worth of code without having to call out 20 functions, which is, which, which is a big benefit. Um, it turns out that that is still too slow. Um, well, it was too slow when um, basically what would happen is you'd call the ARM CPU and it would run however many cycles and it would return and then you can go do some stuff. But all that saving and restoring of the virtual processor state um, costs too much. And so actually now it just calls, if, there's a, if the hardware needs servicing, it just calls directly from the assembly code into the, um, into the uh, emulator code. And it doesn't save hardly any registers except like the status register um, and the PC um, because nothing in the emulator right now actually needs to do that. If you were to try and do the uh, sort of emulated ROM stuff that I know exists in, in BM where you start reading and writing registers, then um, extra work you know, from within the emulator code then you'd have to do extra work. Um, the, the CPU is, uh, let me see, uh, oh yeah. And, and so the CPU, as, as we've said, it, is running, um, it, it's free running um, up until when it interacts with the hardware. And so the only thing that's actually throttling the CPU speed is when those calls into the hardware block. And so um, the way the CPU is actually throttled um, on the RP2040 is purely because it tries to, at some point it tries to write sound into a buffer and that sound buffer is full because the hardware doesn't have it, you know, the hardware is still playing the previous sound buffer. And at some point you get synced to the correct rate by the fact that the, the, the amount of sound you're producing is clocked out at exactly the right rate as, as a real BB, uh, as a real bead would. Um, I hope that makes sense. And that's, and that's about hundred millisecond resolution. So the CPU is, it, it, you know, if, if you were doing other external stuff, it's currently only synced to about 100 milliseconds. Um, and, and you might ask, well, what about the CPU? Uh, sorry, what about the video you've asked about? Uh, I've, I've said that you sync on a scanline basis. Um, so here's a little bit about the video. Um, and I'm going very fast. Hopefully um, people are, are following along. Um, uh, on the RP2040, there is no RAM for a frame buffer. So the emulator does not have a frame buffer. <laughs> Um, and so um, this is generally the way we do stuff on RP2040 anyway on the Pico. Um, and that is, uh, there is a library in what we call Pico Extras, which is just the stuff that isn't in the SDK yet. And there's a library called Scan Video, and it's called Scan Video because it's um, scan, scan out. Um, basically what it's doing is it's producing um, pixel data on the GPIOs in real time. And it uses the programmable IO to do that. Um, and then there's the, the scan video library. It's basically a, a library which takes care of uh, signaling on the timing pins and it takes care of, of pushing the scan lines out at the right time. And then as your code, all, your, all you have to do is you have to, it'll tell you I need a scan line for row 17 and you give it a scan line and it's got a little queue and then it, it pushes those out. And so it's actually really cool when you're writing an emulator for something like the Beeb because you're actually working at the level of, of the scan line, as in you're generating pixel data on the fly based on video data, you know, a byte of data from the Beeb's RAM and the ULA settings, and you're translating that on the fly to produce um, to produce the video output. Um, of course, it does mean, um, unlike a regular emulator, you can't, you know, you have to run at 15 megahertz. Uh, sorry, 50, 50 hertz, um, you, you don't have an option to not produce pixel data. If you don't produce pixel data, you get no pixel data. And so 
it does require that the timing, not only that you're running at 50 hertz, but that you are consistently producing pixel data, you know, even if what you're doing um, is variable in, in, in speed. Um, um, just out of, if you, if you actually happen to run the emulator of Pico and look at your monitor, you'll notice that it's actually in 1280 by 1024, uh, which seems like an odd resolution to choose for the Beeb, but um, um, it's mostly because there are 256 scan lines on the Beeb, <laughs> and so uh, we'll want, to, want some uh, multiple of that. Um, and then actually in mode seven, there's really uh, 512 scan lines if you deinterlace it. Um, and then there's 640 pixels wide. So 1280 by 1024 turns out to be a good um, resolution and we can do the pixel doubling for free in the PIO. So uh, that's, that's no big deal. Um, and here's a little fun fact, um, you know, at first, you know, on a real B mode seven, you know, it draws one, it's interlaced. So it draws 256 scan lines of one, of one frame and then 256 scan lines of the other field of the frame. Um, which means that it's producing half the amount of data that you'd need for the full, for the full res display per frame, if, if that makes any sense. And I was like, well, this is fantastic because my code isn't yet fast enough to do twice, the many, twice as many scan lines. I can just about do the number of scan lines for 256 scan lines in a frame. And when I say 256, I'm talking about the vis visible scan lines as opposed to the 312 odd total scan lines that there are in a um, PAL frame. Um, and so I had this, what I thought was a really cool idea, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll generate one frame and then I'll generate the other frame and I'll use my scan video library to offset them. Um, so they'll be, they'll, they'll be full with an offset and because I'm running at 50 hertz, it will look all interlacy and cool, which it really did. It looked very, very cool, except it's a little hard on the eyes, but I, I believe that a real beeb in, in mode seven actually is really flickery. Um, the only problem, was that it burned into my monitor, which is altogether too much emulation. <laughs> I was like, I didn't, I wasn't going for that much authenticity. Um, and so uh, the reason it, it turns out, it seems like, especially all, all the Dell monitors until recently, they really don't expect um, alternating fields of close together black and full intensity white and black. Um, it must confuse whatever auto hardware they have, but. Fortunately, it isn't permanent, but it is a little scary because it lasts, you know, up to, um, but you have to sort of wipe it with another window. It, it, it slowly fades over time. But I was like, okay, we've we got, we got, we got, we got to not do that. People will be upset if it happens to their TV. And so I moved on to, um, I moved on to using, um, uh, moved on to um, moving uh, to doing uh, 512 scan lines that you said to speed up the code some. This slide could totally have done with um, a picture, but I was running, I, I left it all a bit too late, but um, the way the video works is it just, um, you know, the CRTC is character based and that equate, you know, there's 80 characters across the screen. We have 640 pixels across the screen. So uh, each character is eight pixels and we um, basically have lookup tables for the pixel runs for each of the 256 byte values for either eight pixels, eight B pixels in two color modes, 4B pixels in four color modes or 2B pixels in 16 color modes. So it's, it's the same distance across the, across the screen. Um, and we have, um, we have um, basically a, a lookup table with, with dirty bits so that if, if any of the palette changes, we can, we can replace the lookup tables um, for each byte value based on the, the subsequent palette change. Palette change, sorry. And then finally, um, Rather randomly, we have three teletext source pixels, and that's because there's 40 characters wide in a teletext mode. Each character is based on six pixels. Um, and then it's, um, uh, so each half of the character is three pixels, but it's actually filtered. And so that three pixels for an 80th of the screen is actually um, filtered and, and blown up to eight pixels wide. But basically the code is, is always the same and it, it works that way. Um, and so here is, here is probably one of the most interesting, uh, well, not, here's an interesting thing to show about uh, a problem that, that arose with the emulator, which is we have one CRTC, which is the 6845 in the beam, which has its idea of, of where the beam is on the display and when you're in VSync and all that good stuff. 
But now at the other end, rather than the frame buffer, we have the RP2040, which is producing a, 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 a signal with um, H syncs and V syncs, and it and is actually drawing a particular scan line at a particular point. And of course, the 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 beep side can can mess with the video modes and start doing nasty things like vertical rupture, and it can also change modes where the timings change and forget to do a V sync and all these all these nasty things. And so, I really wanted to decouple these two things, um, but also. Um, it turns out to be pretty handy because we've got two cores and putting the video on another core is actually a, a really good um, separation of concerns um, or, 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 or of labor as much as anything. And I have this thing which for no particular good reason is called display wire, which is basically a decoupling of the video stuff from the CPU side. Um, and it's just implemented with a circular buffer, but um, what, what, um, and I say ideally decoupled because in the ideal, you know, hopefully the CPU never, never has to block um, waiting um, on uh, on the being space in the buffer because it's probably because that might cause a stutter in the sound. And equally, the video should never have to to run out of data to to deal with from the uh, circular buffer because then the video would would stop. Um, and so, what goes across the wire? Well, because um, the video is timing sensitive, we actually send any CRTC register change, any CRT timing event. So things like, you know, start of line, um, you, know, uh, you know, start of a display line, um, a run of pixels, um, ULA changes. Um, um, but we can gather runs of pixels, which is really good because then on, on the video side, we don't even have a pixel. We don't even have a function called per, per character. We just do, we just loop over, um, you know, if there's, if there's 25 uninterrupted characters with nothing else happening, it will draw those all as one, all as one go. And just to be clear, like when I say the pixel runs include the actual bytes read from video RAM at the correct point in time, which allows you to decouple. So, you know, you, you couldn't look at the video RAM at display time because it's, you're now completely out of sync with what it was at the time. Hopefully that makes sense. And so to summarize, like core, core one is writing to this circular buffer, but it's generally uh, throttled in its speed by, um, by not overrunning where the sound is supposed to be. And then core two is, is consuming from this buffer, um, but only when told to when the video hardware needs another scat line. And then we have this buffer in between, which has perhaps about a frame of slack. Um, it seems to work, so I never actually looked into it in any greater detail, but it, it seems to be long enough to, for it to correct. Most of the time, you'll occasionally see um, a, a um, brief screen glitch where it loses sync. Um, so I need to fix that. Um, just a, a quick summary of the hardware used. Um, so we talked about PIO. Um, there's one state machine, which is doing the video timing signals, and then it sends an IRQ to start the other scan lines, or to start the scan lines. And so what the scanline state machines do is they're basically taking a DMA transfer and interpreting it and producing 16-bit uh, pixel, pixel values. Um, and it can do stuff like run, line, run length encoding on the PIO, although we don't use that for, um, we don't use that for the bead because it's, we, we just, we, we're actually producing 640 pixels of raw pixel data. And that's for the main screen display, but I actually have a menu over the top and that is doing something clever on the PIO. It's actually consuming one bit per pixel data. So it's effectively a different video uh, mode overlaid on the other video mode, um, where, which has two colors. One is transparent and one is the, the foreground color. And I say it has uh, two colors. It has two colors per scan, per scan line. So each scan line can be a different color if you want. And then there's another state machine, which is uh, doing I2S audio. Um, we could do PWM audio too, which um, I'll get to in a sec as well. Um, and so the, the DMA, we're not using a whole bunch of bandwidth really, we're doing audio, we've got two video transfers. And the other thing we do is, is we stream the disk data. As I said, um, you know, reading from flash is a little slow. Uh, there's a facility in the RP2040 to, um, to stream from flash when you're not using it. And so we're using that for, for disk, as in when you start reading a disk sector, we start it reading in the background and then you can see, you know, we can read up to as many bytes as have already been transferred, which seems to work pretty well. 
and avoids you blocking while you wait for data um, from the disk, which is in Flash. And then the interpolator is a funky little, um, um, the, the, the RP2040 has divide, uh, uh, extra hardware for divider on each processor and also has this interpolator thing, um, which is basically used um, for shift it, shifts, for a single cycle shift adds and uh, masking um, um, to accelerate various things. And we can use it to um, produce the correct address you know, given a 16-bit 60, uh, um, uh, address from the BBC address space, we can use it to get a, give us, in a single cycle, a pointer to the address in, um, in, uh, in the RP2040 address space. So that's quite handy. Um, and so uh, where, where does this all end up? Well, we have um, buttery smooth 50 frames a second. It's really nice. I, I, I'm sure plenty of emulators look pretty good, but when you're actually generating at 50 frames a second on the nose, because that's what the what the video output is, then that's pretty greedy. Um, as I say, the RP2040 is running at 270 megahertz, which is a multiple of 45 megahertz, which is the um, pixel clock for 1280 by 1024. Um, any slower than that, and um, you know, some of the more esoteric games uh, like Firetrack um, don't. Uh, don't work so well. Um, when I say esoteric, it's more um, like menu systems which sit there pulling the keyboard and stuff like that. Um, um, and I say it's pretty much maxed out in those cases. Um, my all of my hardware event stuff and the cycle stuff is is not it is um, obviously wrong. Actually, I mean you can tell it's wrong by looking at it. Um, but any try any time I tried to fix it, I actually made it worse. So you know I need to go back. Uh, and perhaps with some um, expertise from people who know how it's supposed to work. <laughs> um, you know, I, I have those random hangs um, in um, in various games, which are known to, have, known to have random hangs if you don't do the SEI and CLI exactly right and stuff like that. But it, it seems to work. I'd say my goal here um, was was basically to make a, an, an emulator which I could play some games on. It wasn't necessarily at the time to have the best and most functional um, emulator. Um, I need to get to questions and demos soon, so we'll just go through this. Um, this is quite fun. Uh, you can pause in the emulator, um, but there's no frame buffer, and as you probably realize, you need the CPU to be running, the 6502 to be running to actually produce pixel data. And so um, what I do is I'll, when you pause, I, I use one frame to basically replace some lookup tables with a low-res filtered version of the image, and then we display that, and then I... Um, uh, I use that um, after the fact. So it, it basically, um, it has to generate a low res version of the of the screen. Um, if you remind me to show them over that during uh, the actual demo. Um, and then um, future stuff, um, I, I mentioned it, it's a bit, of, um, I, I, I've actually run it on a tiny RP2040, um, which I don't know if I have one kicking around, um, but they're, um, if you haven't seen those, they're, they're about so this is a this is a regular RP2040 size. It's not an RP2040, and then you know the oops, about a third of that size is is a tiny RP2040, which is made by um, Pimaroni, and um, that's kind of cool. Um, and because it's a, a BBC Micro, you only really need to hook up three color pins. Um, it only has uh, twelve pins on on the on the device, I think, but or 16, um, but you can actually run the emulator on that and it is absolutely tiny. Um, and so the fact that um, currently I'm using I2S is a bit annoying because it's an extra chip and so I should use PWM. Um, I obviously uh, would like to, we've got spare uh, GPIOs, we should totally be doing real hardware, um, whether it's parallel ports, serial ports. Um, and then um, I, especially with the, the display wire stuff, I totally want to be able to drive a real cub monitor using the CRTC timings that the, um, that the virtual CTRC is, is generating. I think that would be really, really cool. Um, the tube stuff, that seems sensible. And I think we could make a, if Dominic hasn't already, a universal um, Pico to tube adapter, which um, which you connect to via I2S or uh, IC or SPI or even USB. Um, and then uh, I was amazed within a day of 
I, I released the emulator a week or so ago, and uh, Hoglot has already um, got um, SD cards working by bit banging um, SPI from the 6502. Um, so I was quite amused by that. Um, finally, uh, Raspberry Pi port. Um, I realized that the host mode stuff, which you saw earlier, was plenty faster than a Pi 4. It was a little bit too slow on the others. So I, um, but of course, you can compile the thumb code as ARM32 code. Um, you know, it just doesn't use all the ARM32 registers, so that's good. Um, and then I had problems with the uh, screen copy up not being fast enough, and so I managed to um, trawl, wade my way through DRM prime stuff and stuff to, to get zero copy, display copy up. And um, I couldn't quite figure it out in SDL, so I'm currently using raw X, but now you can run, um, you can run three emulators concurrently on a Pi 2 at, 30, at 50 frames a second. Um, just fine. Um, and the Pi Zero, sadly, is still hobbled. I think it could be done, but it's not really on my list. It would re require rewriting it on, in proper ARM32. Um, it, it's really a question that you, you're like, why, why is it slower than the Pico? And the answer is, I think, because it only has 16K of cache um, or level one cache. And the Pico, effectively being a microcontroller, actually has all of its RAM as level one cache. And so I, I think the emulator needs somewhere between 16 and 128k of RAM cache, based on the fact that that's what a Pi 2 has. And then the 64-bit version needs love as well. Um, so let's have a demo, and people can be thinking of questions. Um, so let me let me try and let me try and do that. Um, okay, so um, here we have a Pico. Um, which is plugged in uh, via the VGA demo baseboard. It, it, we've got a, uh, we're capturing the VGA output and we're cap capturing the sound output, hopefully. Uh, well, we're definitely capturing the video. So we can take a little look at that. Um, this is a twisted brain demo by BitShifters, which is fantastic. Um, it's amazing that it uh, runs on a master. Um, but it's a really good test of uh, the emulator, so I, I like to use it to uh, show off the uh, <coughs> accuracy. Puts the little microcontroller through its paces. talking about pause earlier here we see what happens when you hit pause uh, you get a nicely uh, well nicely I, I call it uh, down filtered uh, low res display but uh, at least it, since the Pico can draw in more colors we get a we get a, 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 a still vaguely um, gives you a good idea of what was going on um, so let's let that run uh, apologize for the sound it sounds a little crunchy uh, the original demo sounds a little better my audio capture doesn't seem to be great 
let's just um, play one more game. It's excellent. It's a great game. Also, you can't beat the uh, fantastic B one bit digital or couple of bit digital audio. you get the idea. So, let's see. Thank you. 
and uh, Tricky also says, are you going to try and get the overclocking down a bit? Um, uh, not really. Um, <laughs> Good answer. I mean, I, yeah. Uh, in, in all fairness, and not with my Pi hat on, you know, uh, you can, I, I think even the slowest of the slow silicon will run at 270 megahertz. You might break your, you might break your warranty, but then they're only $4, so buy another one. So I don't think we, I don't think we've come across one that won't work. I mean, we haven't tried. Even the artificial, even the artificial slow silicon doesn't. We'll run it. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else have we got here? I've asked that one. So, uh, all right. So I think we're at four o'clock. So I think if we can unmute and. Um, Give Graham a round of applause for his excellent um, talk about the BBC emulator.